I want to apologize in case that anything I say this evening is something you're well aware of already. That's something I'm rather cagey about. But Kevin said to me, no, no, not everyone will have much idea what this is about. Well, I said, I'm sure, being St. Benedict, you know, Benedict and all that, many will. So if I do that, I hope you not think I'm, what's the word, talking down or something. So please, I apologize. Okay, well, thank you genuinely for coming. I really feel that this is uh, in itself, not my talk, but in itself an important subject, which I approach with enthusiasm, but realism. Like so many things in the life of the Christian church of the centuries, we can be extremely enthusiastic about things and then we have to face the reality of ourselves and what is. So let me begin. And by the way, I'm very happy that a young man in the back there, who kindly, at least at the moment, is here, he's putting up with us, you know, he's the future. So as I, as I go into this, I'm happy. You're on your way. Well, thank you, William, for coming. And your mum as well, even if it's a quick one. Bye-bye. <laughs> the head, heading for this evening's talk is Synods and Synodality. What? why and where might we be going? And I have to admit that the phrase synods and synodality is probably not a phrase that regularly slips off the tongue at breakfast or a coffee break. It is, however, the phrase used by <coughs> Pope Francis to refer to the synod that he set in motion in October 2021. And this synod is due to reach its climax in Rome this coming October 2024. That's three years after this rather lengthy process began. And one of the problems, I think, has been that while at the beginning people were sort of into it, etc., etc., it then kind of went off the agenda for two years. It has been going on, but it's rather lost sight of, actually, by many people. It's actually extremely rich reality going on the continents of the world. I said Pope Francis. Yesterday was the 11th anniversary of the election of him as successor to the Apostle Peter, as Bishop of Rome, Pope in the Universal Church. And as one looks back through those 11 years, it becomes very clear that synods and what he sees as their importance in helping fulfill the mission that Jesus entrusted to the Church are something he has sought to develop and promote. And in fact, it'll probably be one of the most precious legacies of his time as Pope. Now, synods are, as you know, not something harebrained and newfangled, as if this Latin American Pope is upsetting the apple carts for the sake of it. No, synods are deeply rooted in the tradition of the Church. And thanks to the Holy Spirit, they have been a source of great fruitfulness century after century in the life and mission of the church worldwide. Francis, following and developing the work of his predecessors as Pope, is seeking with others to bring new energy and life to this precious heritage from those who've gone before. And speaking here at the Newman Association, I'm convinced that Newman is smiling down approvingly at the efforts to bring this synodal tradition of the church to life again in ways appropriate to our time. It fits like a glove with his way of seeing and being church. And perhaps he'll be gazing down with particular interest here in Ealing, since as you know better than me, he spent eight years of his early life at the great Ealing School in St. Mary's Road. Ealing helped shape his remarkable intelligence and insight and grounded him in the classics, preparing him to study the writings of the fathers of the church to very good effect. Before going any further, and before I'm accused of speaking Vaticanese or churchy gobbledygook, let's look for a moment at those two words, synod and synodality. Sincere apologies to those of you who are already well aware of their meaning. But it has been suggested to me 
that not everyone be, might be quite sure about what they mean, so bear with me. Synods and councils are words that have been used since the early days of the church, and they refer to the meetings of members of the Christian community at local levels and also at the much wider level. Why? For the purpose of articulating faith and establishing a degree of order and harmony in the life of the ecclesial community, the family of the church. That's their purpose. Now, such meetings were a regular feature of the church right through the first millennium. And they have continued in the second millennium, but for historical reasons, they have been rather more a feature of the Eastern Orthodox churches than the church in the West. Although it's been, of course, the Western church that has actually spread across the continents of the world in the last 500 years or so. Now, some of you probably know the word synod or synod, as our brothers, in the, brothers and sisters in the Church of England often say, the word synod comes from two Greek words, syn meaning with or together, and odos meaning path or journey. It presents us with the, the beautiful image of making a journey together. The word council, on the other hand, comes from the Latin word concilium, which referred to a group, very openly, a group of people meeting. But throughout the history of the church, until very recent times, roughly until about 19, uh, 1963, council has been taken as equivalent to the word synod. They have been practically interchangeable. Now to grasp what synods or councils are about, think of the Nicene, cried, Nicene Creed that we use at Mass on Sundays. This creed resulted from the discussions and prayer, after much debate in the previous years, at the councils or synods of Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople in 381. It was in those two places, both of them now in modern-day Turkey, that the creed we use at Mass was finally and clearly articulated. The final articulation actually came later, near 451 at the Council of Carcedon, Carcedon when they brew, brew it, drew it closer together. Now, when we look at those two synods or councils, together with two other very important councils, such as the one at Ephesus in 431 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451, they kind of stand out as mountaintops, upon which there is still agreement among almost all the major Christian churches in our time. However, besides the mountain peaks, there are a host of smaller synods, foothills, you might say, in comparison with the mountain peaks, which nevertheless were important. I do not know if anyone here is from Northumbria or Yorkshire, but in the year 604, an important local synod of the Christian church was held in Whitby, at that time in the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. And the purpose of the meeting, which was successful, was to settle differences on a number of matters between the Celtic tradition, associated with the Celtic monks and missionaries, and the Roman tradition, which had come in from the south of Britain with St. Augustine. And mention of St. Augustine, the Benedictine monk sent by Pope Gregory the Great, reminds us, of course, of the enormous contribution through the centuries of the Benedictine tradition. Something, of course, happily lived and celebrated here with St. Benedict's Abbey, the parish, the school, and so on. The Synod of Whitby was successful. Agreement on the date for celebrating Easter, the most important feast of the Christian calendar, being one of the major points of agreement. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> one of the 81, proposal or recommend 81 proposals or recommendations that the Synod in Rome last October was that in the year 2025, which is the 17th centenary 
of the Council of Nicaea in 325, it would be good if the Christian churches could seek agreement. Actually, funnily enough, that year, 2025, unusually, it's actually when the dates between the different Christian churches will be on the same date, the Eastern Orthodox churches and the West and so on. They said it would be good if the Christian churches could finally seek agreement together on the date of Easter celebration around the world. Synod, journeying together. The Westminster Diocese Synod Report that gathered together the reports of parish consultations two years ago, including a valuable report from this parish, observed that it was significant how much more often the term accompaniment came up in the synodal conversations much more than journeying together, accompaniment. In the words of the report, the thousands, and it was true actually in 2000, end of 2021 into 2022, the thousands who have engaged in the synodal process, what this diocese and others, discovered how energizing it is to accompany one another in a deep and conscientious listening. Synodality, on the other hand, is a word that's only come into use in recent times. It's a term that sums up our efforts to find ways by which the concept of making a journey together, accompanying one another, might become more fully embedded in the life and actions of the Christian community. That's basically what synodality is after. As Pope Francis said just recently about this three-year vast consultation, this synod is about synodality and not about this or that theme. What does he mean by that? He said the important thing is how the reflection is done. That is what he calls the synodal way. That word how, how the reflection and discussion take place, a synodal way. And Francis has repeated again and again what he means by the synodal way. It consists of, you've heard this before, of three necessary ingredients. And it's important to look again at those ingredients if we want to grasp what synods are trying to be about. They're summed up in three words, listening, speaking, and discerning. First of all, listening. The effort to listen to what the other is saying, really listen. I apologize, you've got to listen to me tonight, but anyway, really listen. Listening deeply to one another. This can be transformative. Secondly, the readiness to say sincerely and with courage, it's not always easy, although always with respect for the other and in the spirit of charity, what one thinks, saying honestly what one thinks, what the Greeks call paresia. Thirdly, and above all, to make a sincere and thoroughgoing effort to try to discern what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and to the whole church through this mutual listening and speaking. And that third ingredient of synods is profoundly different to so many of the secular debates in politics and the media. Why? Because it must be absolutely rooted in faith and in prayer. Without that, there's no synod. Now, I've found that some people become mildly, or even more than mildly, apoplectic when they hear the word discernment, as if it's mumbo-jumbo Vaticanese or mystifying nonsense, but not so you will find that it is the word that describes what goes on in the council or chapter meetings of religious orders, such as the Benedictines, Franciscans, Dominicans, and so many religious congregations of women and men. The purpose of those meetings is to work together, to work, I'll never forget, years ago I was in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I was staying with a couple there who were deeply involved, good, very good Catholics, and working with them on something. And they had a, I could see they had a great marriage. And one, one day, rather naively, I tend to be, I said to them, you know, you've got a great marriage. And the wife said, we've worked at it. <laughs> so 
you'll find that the word discernment is precisely to do with working at it. The purpose is to work together an atmosphere of faith and prayer to see what needs to be done to enable them to achieve and live out their mission, their raison d'etre. Now, this is far from esoteric. It has importance now in our own country. For example, the Diocese of Arundel and Brighton here in the UK, that's the diocese, as you probably know, includes East and West Sussex and part of the, the county of Surrey. It's been carrying out over a number of years a lengthy reflection in a spirit of sharing and prayer in many, many meetings since about 2018, interrupted to some extent by the pandemic, clergy, parish core groups, all sorts of people in the diocese, to see how best, this is really synodal style, to see how best in present conditions of that diocese, lovely part of England, they can respond to the reality. What reality? Firstly, that the number of priests available to work in the diocese will continue rapidly to decline over an extended number of years. That's the first reality they had to face. Secondly, against that, They've asked, well, what is the principal role of the priest in a diocese? They came out with the three words or three phrases, preaching the word, the celebration of the sacraments, and the pastoral care of the people in the priest's charge, working with those people. The diocese has found itself facing two alternatives. I give this as an example, really, of synodal style. Either it continues to reduce the number of priests, which is going to happen in the next 10 years pretty quickly, try to reduce it, right? But actually that extends a period of pain and uncertainty. And it's problematic as vacancies do not always occur in places suitable for amalgamation of parishes, which many people anyway are not keen on. Or in a way that's, there's another way they said, the diocese could take, and it is taking it, could take the bold step of reducing the number of parishes in one go, carefully mind you, and in a way that is sustainable in a longer term. The diocese has decided, in a synodal style, to take the bold path. And I mention this because this is not just relevant to Arundel and Brighton. The diocese decided to reduce the 60, 70 or more parishes to 11 deaneries. They aim to do this by mid-2025. And once the diocese is restructured, each parish can be run with a number of available priests. And of course, they're bringing in also many lay people, religious, to work with them. This, they feel, will give the flexibility to respond to current challenges in a way that is resilient, sustainable, and adaptable. Without such a bold step, the bishop has said, the pressure on the priests that they do have now would, in the diocese view, become impossible for them to bear. And I think one has seen that in different parts of the country, an enormous strain as priests get older and struggle, then looking after two, three, even four parishes. Synods more generally mean that having really tried as church locally, regionally, and internationally to listen to one another, to discuss, pray, think, and pray some more, it means the church then does its best to come to an agreed understanding or course of action, just as they did in Nicaea, in Constantinople in the 4th century, Whitby in the 7th century, the Second Vatican Council in the 20th century, as they will be trying to do in the synod in Rome next October. <clears throat> For a moment, let's change gear. Are you following me here? Have I put anyone to sleep already? <laughs> if I fall asleep, forgive me. So. <laughs> it's in the light of what we've just been talking about that the title chosen by the Pope for the Synod session last October 23 was so apposite. He called it a conversation in the spirit. Now that phrase brings with it two very important words, presence and faith. Presence. 
To have a conversation in the Spirit means to recognize the presence here, now and always, of God's loving bestowal of Himself in Jesus Christ and in the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is present everywhere, transcendent and yet within all things. In the final words of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, I am with you always till the end of time. And indeed, it's our faith that Jesus Christ is present amongst us now, here in Ealing, in and through the Spirit. The second word, faith. Faith is the free response to this divine initiative, not our initiative. That's central absolutely to the faith of Christianity. It's God's initiative, God's self-gift. And a crucial aspect of synodality is that just as the Christian community was originally constituted by faith, so too it always needs to be reconstituted by faith. And that faith is the apostolic faith and hope that has been handed down to us, handed down tradition. The development of the community's faith is what that wonderful book in the New Testament, The Acts of the Apostles, is all about. And we will be listening, as you know, to listenings from the Acts in the Sundays after Easter right through to Pentecost. It says, what happened? Dear friends, a highly significant feature of the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Spirit, is that it so emphasizes the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit that this New Testament book could equally be called the Acts of the Spirit. And I want to suggest that chapter 10 of Acts relates directly to what we are talking about tonight. It illustrates that the Spirit of God can draw the Christian community, can he indeed, the Church, along paths that it does not expect, or even at first, even welcome. In that chapter 10 of Acts, Peter, reluctantly at first, and contrary to his lifelong practice as a faithful Jew, is drawn by the Spirit to visit the house and family of Cornelius, a Gentile centurion, right against everything in his experience and practice. And the end result is that Peter says to Cornelius, you know that it's unlawful for Jews to mix with or visit someone of another race. But God has made it clear to me that I must not call anyone profane or unclean. God has made it clear to me, admits Peter. And today, in its synodal journey, the Christian community is called to discern, to work out, to discover together, the paths along which the Spirit is calling it, and to respond as Peter did, however reluctantly, even if those paths challenge us to change our ways of thinking and acting. We, the whole Church, are repeatedly called to conversion, to be responsive in faith to the presence and action of the Spirit wherever He might lead us. In chapter 15 of Acts, we find what is often described as the Council of Jerusalem. It's a perfect example of what councils and sinners are all about. It was there that in the light of what I've just described about the Apostle Peter and the Gentile centurion, it was decided, after prayer, and much back and forth, discussion for and against, it was decided that it would not be necessary for the Gentile converts to Christianity to follow all the Jewish customs, the Mosaic, the Mosaic law. In the letter sent by the apostles after that meeting to the communities that included Gentile converts to Christianity, the text reads, it has been decided by the Holy Spirit and by us. 
the Christian community gathered in prayer to discuss a point that was crucial for the entire future of Christianity, namely opening up the community to men and women of every ethnicity and nation, had recognized what God was asking of it. Today, and this is what synods are about, we need remaining faithful to the Church's origins in the risen Christ and His gift of the Spirit. We need to try and see what God is asking of us. That's what synods are about. At this point, I'm going to take a drink if I may. And it is water, I promise you. <laughs> Wonderful things, these thermoses. <laughs> At this point, I suggest we look together not simply the mechanics. I don't want to illusion all the mechanics of who did this and what did that and which meeting was then, etc. While well, rather than all those procedures, important as they are, of what is going on at this moment in the Synod that Pope Francis has set in motion, I want to look instead at, suggest we look at, a framework. And the framework I have in mind is one within which to consider and reflect upon the what and why of synods and synodality in our time, as well as a few points at least about where we think or hope the present synod might take us. The what, why and where of synods. Now here is the suggested framework or horizon. And bear with me for a moment if the language I move into is a little, might switch you off. <laughs> the present synod on synodality is a further implementation and development of the theological vision of the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965. That's what it is at its heart. Further implementation, following through, and development. Yes, I'm afraid I've used a phrase that might be taken as an invitation to head for the bar, theological vision. But all it means is that we, the Church, which I trust all of us here tonight love and are grateful for, are seeking to understand more deeply, trying to grasp more fully what God is calling the Church to do at this time, where he is inviting us to go. Now this framework certainly does not cover all the aspects of what we mean by synods and synodality. But I think it offers an interpretive key to seeing what is happening in the worldwide Church in our time. Are you still there? Great, thank you. <laughs> now, it's particularly appropriate that we should be talking about this at a meeting of the Newman Association because it relates to something that was central to the thought of John Henry Newman. That is, the development in the Church's self-understanding of its vocation and mission in Christ and His Spirit. Such a development is firmly grounded in tradition but open to ways in which, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can grow in our understanding and living of it. That approach was seminal in Vatican II, and it is directly relevant to the present synodal process. I'm going to highlight a few points I consider relevant by contrasting the First Vatican Council, 1869-1870, Stay with me, please. And the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965. We'd need to go back much further in history of the Catholic Church for a fuller understanding, but that's not possible this evening. Please note, and this is important, that what I'm going to say, there's inevitably the danger of oversimplification and even caricature. Please remember that. In my attempt to highlight just a few points. Now, when Pius IX called the First Vatican Council in the 1860s. He and many bishops with him, even if not all, had a very bleak and negative view of what was happening in the world around them. They were suffering from traumas that had built up over centuries. Without going into any depth, let me 
list just a few of them. A first trauma going right back, which then continued, was the struggle that surfaced strongly in the 14th century, and then continued, between those who claimed that councils had priority over the papacy as against those who held the opposite view. And the name which it goes by was conciliarism, a second trauma, and a trauma that compounded the tension just mentioned was the shattering experience of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, followed by the Thirty Years' War, a mix of politics and religion, in the 17th century. A third trauma, and perhaps the deepest of all, lay in the rationalism of the 18th century Enlightenment, followed by the philosophically based atheism of Ludwig Feuerbach in the 19th century. And atheism was taken up directly into the historical materialism of Karl Marx and his lifelong collaborator Friedrich Engels. A fourth trauma had its roots in the cataclysmic experience of the French Revolution of 1798. Followed by Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion of the Papal States in 1798, he kidnapped Pope Pius VI, seven, sixth, he was sixth, declared the end of the papacy. He didn't know that. Yeah, Napoleon declared the end of the papacy. He wasn't quite right there. He took the Pope as prisoner to France, where he died in exile the following year. And a more recent trauma for Pius IX and the bishops of Vatican I lay in the burst of revolutionary fervor that swept across Europe in 1848. This revolutionary fervor, it's fascinating when you study it, was intimately linked with the twin currents of nationalism and democracy, which were such powerful drivers of change right throughout the 19th century, nationalism and democracy. The church at this time came under physical attack in Rome. Pius IX's prime minister in the Papal States was shot dead on the steps of the Quirinal where the Pope was actually living at the time. The Pope himself, in danger for his life and disguised as a simple cleric, escaped south to Gaeta in the kingdom of Naples. In order to under the mindset that these traumas formed, a Pius IX and a great number of the Vatican I bishops, let me quote, if I may, from the letter he wrote, convoking, calling together that first Vatican Council. You're doing well, I can see you're still with me. Thank you. It is now evident and clear to everyone, he said, how terrible is the storm that tosses the church and how great are the evils besetting civil society. The Catholic church is attacked and trampled on by the enemies of God and man. Everything that is sacred is held in contempt. Ecclesiastical possessions are seized and ministers of religion are harassed on every side. Not only our holy religion, but human society itself is plunged into an indescribable state of chaos and misery. That's how was his mind as he approached Vatican I. And in that almost apocalyptic over worldview, the overall attitude, I, don't, I'm, I warn you, I'm caricaturing to some extent, the overall attitude of Vatican I towards the world around it was profoundly and even aggressively defensive, distrustful and suspicious. And the council, as has been happening, the so-called Untermontane movement leading up to it, turned to the papacy as a point of unity around which the church could rally. And it really felt that it needed to rally. It was in that context that the focus on primacy and papacy was crowned by the solemn definition of papal infallibility. Now, it's not my intention here tonight to enter, you'll be happy to, into the theological aspects of this definition, which holds true in our time as it did then. It continues to hold true. I want to point out, however, that it resulted in an exaggerated view of the papacy, sealing it in, seeing it in almost solitary isolation from and above the rest of the church. And it brought in its train a centralization of church authority in the pope and his Roman Curia. Having worked there for 26 years, I have some experience of it. In the situation that followed, there were even those who considered the synods and councils, which have played a huge role 
in the church's long history. They thought they were no longer necessary. An even regular collaboration with the bishops in the exercise of the teaching office was regarded, at least by some, as hardly required. Vatican I resulted in a papacy that was highly monarchical in style. And in the 90 years, 90 years, between Vatican I and Vatican II, there was in reality a kind of creeping infallibility, with ever more documents emanating from the Pope and the Roman Curia that contained teachings, regulations or warnings on almost every aspect of Catholic practice and belief. Now at this point here, Newman Association, this point in our reflection, the attitude of John Henry Newman is really instructive. He accepted the Vatican I definition and encouraged others to do so, and I certainly personally accept it. However, he considered the definition to be inopportune. Why? Because he felt that in the lopsided insistence on centralizing authority, that characterized the Church of Pius IX, it would be difficult for the doctrine to be rightly understood. Newman, a saint and a man of deep faith. He was also blessed with great foresight. He believed that the Vatican I definition needed and would ultimately receive correction. He wrote to a friend, the late definition, this is in the 1870s, the late definition does not need so much to be undone as to be completed. It needs safeguards to the Pope's possible acts, explanations as to the matter and extent of his power. And he said, this is beautiful. Let us be patient. Let us have faith. A new Pope and a reassembled council may trim the boat. And so it did, but 90 years later. Now, one of the effects of Vatican I was a loss of equilibrium between the hierarchical, which is a real aspect, and the community aspects of the church, both real aspects of the church. The relationship between the hierarchical ministry and the community of the baptized as a whole, and between the Ecclesia, ecclesia Docens, or teaching church, and the Ecclesia Dicens, or learning church, appeared as a dichotomy as an almost unbridgeable gap, rather than exemplifying the indissoluble unity of the Christian community. The great Dominican theologian, Yves Congar, referred to this way of seeing the church as a hierarchology rather than an ecclesiology. And the repeated emphasis on authority in this view, and this thing's important, what, was, what, was, what, what are some of the effects of this? It led to a view, a focus, on a relationship of superiority and subordination, and also a focus on the elements of separation in ecclesiastical structures. What do I mean by the phrase superiority, subordination? Well, it's vividly illustrated in an encyclical of Pope Pius X, Behementanos, in 1906. Pius X was a saint. May he intercede for us tonight. That doesn't mean always got everything right. He said, therefore, this society, the church, is of necessity and by its nature unequal. That is, a society comprising two categories of persons, the pastors and the flock, those who occupy a rank in different degrees of the hierarchy and the multitude of the faithful. And so distinct are these two categories that with the pastors alone rests the right and authority to move and direct all the members towards the end purpose of society. The one duty of the multitude, he said, is to accept that they are governed and to follow obediently the guidance of the pastors. Well, three years ago, on the 18th of September, 2021, 115 years after Pius X's encyclical, and shortly before the present Synod on Synodality opened, Pope Francis addressed about a thousand or so representatives 
from the diocese of Rome, bishops, clergy, women and religious, men religious, members of the laity, and his words express what, in his view, synods and synodality all about. I've come here, he said, to encourage all of you to take this synodal process seriously and to tell you that the Holy Spirit needs you. Listen to him. Listen to each other. Do not leave anyone out. Now there we can hear and see very clearly some of Francis's key ideas as to what synods are about. Francis stressed that the diocesan phrase of this synodal process is really and truly important. Why? Because it makes possible, makes it possible to listen to all the baptized. That theme, listening to all the baptized, has come up repeatedly through his pontificate. And he's tried consistently, 2014-2015 synod, and then the youth synod in 2018, Amazon synod in 2019, and this one. He's tried to make listening to all the baptized, he's tried to build up long consultation periods into the synodal process. Dear friends, on a worldwide basis, that doesn't always happen easily. Sometimes things get dropped in between, and I think one or two over the last two years have been dropped, but the aim and the idea is wonderful. And actually, a lot of the things that have come out, like the national reports and the, and the um, continental reports, are full, if you have time to read them, full of wonderful things of people testifying from their areas regarding the church that they love and care for. In his address that I mentioned a few moments ago, 2021, he said, <laughs> the contrast here, there is considerable resistance to overcoming the image of a church where there is a rigid separation between superiors and subordinates. Those two words echo? You've heard those two words? Between the one who teaches and the one who learns. Walking together, on the other hand, reveals a way forward that is horizontal rather than vertical. Now, as we can see from that contrast between the approaches of two popes at different moments in history, the papacy, like the church itself, is not immutable. It is capable of change without losing its identity or its continuity with the past. The path on which the church is now embarked emerged from the Second Vatican Council, which itself was one of the most important exercises of conciliarity or solid synodality since the great councils of the first millennium. Now, if you're still with me at this point, it's heroic. It really is. Yes. <laughs> we were very fortunate at Vatican II to have had a Pope, Paul VI. By the way, Pope Francis just loves Pope, Pope Paul VI. And in his first year as Pope, that's 11 years ago, he had a group from Brescia, which was um, the original diocese from which Papa Montini, Paul VI, came. And he said, I've got to tell you that in my view, one of the greatest pastoral letters ever written by a pope was Evangelii Nunciandi, announcing the gospel of Paul VI. And his whole approach to mission and evangelization is close to that of Paul VI. So we're fortunate to have had Paul VI. I'm very fond of him. He had the courage and wisdom to discern and accept, even if cautiously, that a renewal of the synodal path was necessary. He was cautious. He established the Synod of Bishops on the 15th of September 1965, and I remember being in Rome at the time. And that began the process that led us to the synod in which the universal church is now engaged. Back to the framework I was talking about. I want to focus on two aspects in this framework, if I may, that lead us, lead us towards a fuller understanding of why and in what way synods and synodality are a path that Vatican II invited us to follow. Those two aspects are inextricably linked. They are pillars that underpin the development of synodality. The first aspect, these two aspects, the first aspect is the collegiality of the Pope with the bishops. They've fought about this for years, but Vatican II really helped gradually moving towards a better relationship. 
It is above all Vatican II's recognition of the college, the collegiality between Pope and bishops in the service of the Church and its mission, together with the actual experience the actual experience of and sharing in the discernment that characterized Vatican II that drew Paul VI to establish the Synod of Bishops. Now, what we are seeing here is nothing less than the papacy in transition. Remains the same papacy, same church, but moving under the Spirit in time. The second of the two aspects is, in my view, that it's not only the papacy that is, is in transition, the church as a whole is in a period of transition. And that's because Vatican II's constitution on the church not only recognizes the collegiality of Pope and bishops, it also sees and places their service within and at the service of the entire communion of all the baptized speaking for the moment of the baptized within the Catholic Church, although the study of what's happened in the other Christian churches in this area is also fascinating. Now, it's this understanding of the Church that lies at the heart of the synodality of the whole Church and that points out the path along which the people of God is invited to travel in this third millennium. That change puts the entire holy and faithful people of God, all those who have been united to Christ through baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, at the center. Now this is a fundamental departure from the pyramid view of church. That does not mean that the Pope, with the bishops and their clergy, must therefore abdicate their apostolic responsibilities. No. What it does mean is that the way their responsibilities are exercised take on different shape and style. We are called upon now to see the church as a communion of all the baptized and to, the sacrament, to see the sacrament ordained ministry, important and necessary as it is, within and at the service of the communion and mission of all those baptized with them in the church. Now, what synodality is all about is seeking to find ways to express this ever more effectively in the daily life of the church and its mission. We must put our hope and our trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, breathed upon the church by the risen Christ, in whose presence we are this evening. Won't be too much longer now. In the synods, Pope Francis is setting in motion a process. It's actually his style. A process that is ongoing, a process that he hopes will gradually increase in momentum. What Francis has in mind is a process that in spite of all the difficulties and tensions and even anger and rage in some quarters, he's seeking under the guidance of the Spirit to find ways in our time with the rest of the church community by which all the members of the Christian community can learn better. It's always a process of learning. It's painful to get there. Learning better how to live and commit themselves together. Its purpose is, faithfully, to carry out more fully the mission and trust of the church by Christ. That's always where our focus must be. It is, of course, of the utmost importance when talking about synods to keep in mind what the mission just mentioned is ultimately about. It is witnessing in life and word to the love of God, the mercy of God revealed in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. Dear friends, it had been my intention, you'll be happy to hear it's had, to go more fully into this synod on synodality and the way it's being organized, but given the constraints of time, let me close. Oh, hallelujah. Let me close by just uh, mentioning a, a few points. It is a remarkable moment. During the synodal process, the goal was not to paper over differences or divergences in people's points of view. Everyone who has taken part has been encouraged by the Pope to express their views 
and to listen to others with an open heart and mind. This process had opened the possibility, a space, for honest and open conversation at all levels. Let's pray this may continue. I think there's enormous potential for the future of the Church in the synodal method seen in these years. You mustn't be naive, God be realistic, but hope, trust. At the same time, given the experience of century after century in the Church's life, it is very probable that the path towards bedding synod and synodality down will be frustrating at times and always challenging. I'm reminded this evening of John Henry Newman's famous sermon at Oscott in Birmingham in July 1852, the first time that the English Catholic bishops had met in synod since the restoration of the hierarchy in 1850. He expressed his hope, as you remember, for a second spring. But he went on to say, Have we any right to take it strange if in this English land the springtime of the church should turn out to be an English spring, an uncertain, anxious time of hope and fear, of joy and suffering, of bright promise and budding hopes, yet withal of keen blasts and cold showers and sudden storms. My dear friends, so then, so now. Thank you. I don't think you're going to have some sort of thing from Rome suddenly coming down on same, but where there's actual refusal, that's another thing. But often it's uncertainty, another talking shop, something that really many priests, they're, they're busy, they're under pressure, and the people themselves, is, is this going back? Is this destroying the church we love? All those things come up. What's attempting to be put in place especially this October this year, is to set in place the encouragement to set up different types of structures, not a uniform structure. One of the interesting things from the Continental meetings that brought in seven areas, actually, they brought people together from different nations, is the different way they saw this. I, for example, in Africa, I was very impressed by the way the image of just family, which fits very much into the, much of the ethos of especially sub-Saharan Africa, uh, came up. Very different in parts of Asia, where, it, tiny, apart from the Philippines, a tiny minority surrounded by the other great religions or non-religions, uh, Islam, Buddhism, uh, and so on. But within those different things, an answer, not answer to your question, but commenting, I don't have the answer. Yes, I think we must, that each Episcopal conference, working with their people, and that's why we've got to find ways of doing it, it's not just, again, top-down, must attempt to find ways suited to that place, which in fact puts into effect what they're talking about here. That really you can't go forward without listening, really listening. And actually, the, I've got it here, the document published, the synthesis at the end of this last October Synod, 41 pages, 81 recommendations or proposals, is really worth reading. But I thought tonight I wouldn't go into it too far. But it's really because it puts forward all sorts of people from the church around the world of the ways they're trying to say, how can we respond in that way? And one have to acknowledge that here and there, I mean, I've heard of parishes where they, uh, one, one friend of mine, she said, I won't say which diocese, she said, uh, the parish priest said, I'm going to have nothing to do with this synod. Now that, I think, has got to change. That's clericalism. I believe very much, I have many, many priest friends and many wonderful priests, but that is actually an assertion of power and a way of seeing church which does not reflect the kenosis, the emptying of Christ the Lord and the way the church is being put forward to see. In answer to your question or comment upon your question, it must be up to the bishops, along with the laity and priests and religious, gradually to seek this way. I'll never forget at the end, when I, during the Vatican Council, as the English College in Rome, we had a very fine theory. By the way, I've gone too long. I'll make this short. 
Uh, we had a very fine theologian from the Gregorian University came and gave a talk. His name was Bernard Lonigan, a famous philosopher theologian. And he gave a very good talk, and someone asked him something similar to your question about the Vatican Council. Well, they'll stop it. And he said, in a Canadian accent I can't imitate, he said, there's a tide moving up the estuary. And there'll be sandbanks here and there. And they'll hold it up for a while. But if the spirit is with that tide, it's not going to stop. Indeed, I mean, after Vatican I, the so-called old Catholics, it might belong to the group called old Catholics, who actually didn't accept the infallibility of the Pope. And a very famous German uh, theologian at the time, I don't remember, Dopp, Doppinger, Doppinger, anyway, um, he left as well. And they still exist in small groups, but it became very isolated groups, rather like the Pius X groups uh, of the, um, you know, the what you call the, uh, Pius X was a saint, not blaming him, but the groups of the uh, Econ, you know, and so on. That has happened after almost every council. Some group like that, either some shooting off ahead and way, it's not, you know, not, the church is lagging behind and going their own way. On the whole, those things tend to peter out. Take the Reformation. Among wonderful things the other Christian churches have done, including mission and martyrdom, and there's been martyrdom in blood of them as well as our, our own people, Catholics. There's something that John Paul II used to talk about, the martyrdom in blood together of Christians. But I spent time in the States where I was working for quite a long time. And what I noticed there was what happened with the Reformation. It wasn't that a great Lutheran church came across and kept itself. It splintered. It splintered into 500, not just the Lutherans, but all the other, the Pennsylvanians and other, etc. It splintered. I'll never forget being in Rome in 1968. I was involved in the liturgical reform at the time. And uh, we went to a meeting of the priests, of the priests of the American college who had already priests and come back to study. And one priest said to the a couple of bishops and so on who were there, including an Anglican who was an uh, Episcopalian, who was an observer uh, on the liturgy of renewal, not taking part but observing. And they said, this man said, bishops, if we like your missal, we'll take it. If we don't, we won't. If we like your whatever you're going to do with a breviary, we'll take it. If we don't like it, we won't take it. And they went on like that. And the a couple of bishops there, Hallinan, and then a man also, Carter from Canada, uh, Hallinan from the States, and then Fred McManus, an American working there. They tried to answer. And eventually the Episcopalian, wonderful man, Dr. Massey Shepherd, uh, who I liked very much, he said, well, I've got to say to you that we are happy that with the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church is not quite so monolithic as it has been. But before you shoot off, like shooting stars into the night, we are trying to come back together. I don't know, it's a comment. There has been great progress. I was actually a consultant to the, um, what used to be called Pontifical Council of Christian Unity. There has been great progress, and I was also involved with World Council of Churches, but first of all, doctrinally, and also on the ground. It has gone through periods of up and down, and then disillusionment. But actually, I was very struck on the eve of this synod last October by a vigil together of the Pope with leaders and members of the other churches praying together for the success of that. And the church, the Pope said there, he said, he's no fool, he's not going to say we just take this and take that. But he said, let's see what the other churches have done and doing, we can learn from it. And he actually he personally hasn't followed so much what uh, Paul VI and then John Paul II went into very much following the, the agreements, you know, between the Anglican Church and said the, the, the documents of agreement between the different churches. But what he has gone in for is working practically on the ground when he can. For example, take the visit to South Sudan. He took with him the man from Scotland of the uh, Presbyterian Church and also Archbishop Welby. And when he went, moving more broadly, to, uh, I think it was the first visit to Israel rather than Iraq, he took with him a friend of his, whom I've met, a Jewish rabbi 
from Argentina, with whom he used to regularly have dialogue, including radio broadcasts, and a Muslim pastor from Argentina with whom he'd worked in that way. We have to work at it gradually. It is coming. And actually, there are some very good things in the recommendations of that last synod uh, to do with that. There were representatives of other churches at that synod. There are attempts to follow it through. The reality is that so many other churches in our own country, for example, are suffering some of the same problems as we do. You know, some people say, I mentioned that what Arnold and Brighton are doing. Well, you might immediately say, well, why don't they immediately ordain a priest? Why don't they have a... Well, that, those are the things to look at in themselves. Look at in themselves. There's things to be looked at and so on. But the Church of England, many other churches, are also facing problems about vocations. They're also finding it difficult to find priests for parishes. What we can do together, let's do together. And more and more as we do it, trusting the Holy Spirit will gradually bring us together. It's far better now than it was when I was a youngster and you weren't allowed to go into an Anglican church if in fact they were going to do this. Or as a man said to me, later became the Archbishop of Dublin, he said to me, when he was a boy in Ireland, uh, he, if they were listening to the radio and at the end of the Our Father, it went on to say, for thine is the switch it off, switch it off. <laughs> I, I don't know, I could go on and on, it's a huge subject. But thank you, it is important. Really, it is important. Right. Uh, uh, obviously, I can't answer that question. But what I can say is moving towards is that he has already begun to put together, with the help of others, um, a mixed group of people from a certain department of the Roman Curia with other people who he thinks can work on subject X or Y to see what they can present in October as possible paths to go forward. Now, if when that path is presented, the Synod makes a vote to say, yes, we would like this to be pursued, then he must pursue it, or not must, but he will be strongly encouraged to pursue it. In each country, and I was talking recently with a priest in the diocese, in each country it's going to be for the bishop with his people to really take some of the things from that and say, well, this seems to fit us. Uh, for example, they just started a synodal process in Salford Diocese, Manchester. Liverpool recently finished a, uh, a synodal process, which got, worked pretty well. Arundel of Brighton is very similar to a synodal process. I'm sure gradually that synods will begin to take place in different parts of the church around the world. There, are, there is opposition, there's negativity in some part, definitely. But as people begin to follow through all the recommendations and so on coming out of this previous synod and now this synod, it is starting to get a movement underway. Can it be guaranteed success? No. Is it the path to follow, above all choosing this and that priority and adapting the way you seek to put it into effect in this or that area and country? Yes and one trusts and prays to the Holy Spirit ultimately. Then the, the, the intention is not just to finish at the end of October 2024, but that things actually flow from that. Some of them will be study areas because there are difficult areas. The people keep talking about the ordination, for example, of women deacons. Well, they've already had two uh, groups working on it, and they're still working on it further. And this recent thing said work further. That's one example. Certain parts of the church want to look at the question, this is particularly true in the Amazon region, where it was requested by the Amazon Synod to possibly ordain married men. That's a huge question. It brings with it in different parts of the church all sorts of things. Social reactions. It's one thing in Africa. It's another thing in the Amazon. It's certainly another thing in the Asian countries where there's many as tremendous respect for celibacy. And there is a tremendous value in celibacy because the priests are socially mobile, etc. Those are just examples, but there are much other things which I think are actually more germane to your question. One of the central things already that came out of the October Synod last, last October, which will certainly come up next October, is the necessity to introduce structures, not just bureaucratic structures, but actual structures which seek to carry through the momentum on all sorts of things in here which are really good in that document in order that they might percolate through. And One just has to have trust. And what can a group like this do? It can actually bring 
pressure to bear on this bishop, that thing, etc., etc., to actually say, well, look, this was said about, for example, I'm not suggesting you do this immediately, but one of the things suggested was that it'd be good if, I don't know, every now and again, there was some sort of assessment of how the bishop's doing, not anti or judging, etc., but in terms of his responsibilities, the way he acts, the way he does it, the financial question, the question of safeguarding and all that, how is he doing? To have a, an audit, as it were, accountability, to build in more accountability. And that's, these are just some random examples. There are others. There's very much the relationship between religious and bishops and religious and the faithful. And the importance, for example, of lay associations, lay movement, religious groups, and religious congregations. I, I could give you all 81 recommendations, but they, they're there. And I think one just has to really trust the sufficient people serious about this, praying about this, that I'm sure good will come. How quickly, how not, what degree of negativity? For example, in the United States, there's been quite a bit of negativity, including within the Episcopal Conference. Each situation is its own situation for its own reasons. But I think there's a tide, as my friend said, moving up the estuary, and there will be sandbags. Let's see what we can do with humility, because we do not have the answer to carry it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.